everyone. My name is Jennifer Ho. I'm the director of the Center for Humanities and the Arts, and I'm also a professor in ethnic studies and a colleague of Dr. Maeda. Um, I also am a friend and colleague to Dr. Tangaraj. I am here purely to do introductory remarks. Um, I do want to begin with a land acknowledgement, which is that um, this event is hosted by the University of Colorado Boulder, which sits on the traditional territories of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho Nation. I'm actually not giving the land acknowledgement that is act formally part of the University of Colorado Boulder, but I do want to explain why I'm giving a land acknowledgement. And that's because if one is to give a land acknowledgement and recognize the power dynamics of settler colonialism, it is also important to think about reparations. And one of the reparations that the University of Colorado system is trying to do um, is to provide in-state tuition for any of um, the members of the traditional um, tribal nations of Colorado. Um, and I think it's worth talking about um, the land acknowledgements, what we, what they are for, what they are really trying to do, and the power dynamics thereof, which brings me to today's talk, um, which I should also say is sponsored by the College of Arts and Science Office of Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, um, my own center, the Center for Humanities and the Arts, the Center for Asian Studies, the Center for African and African American Studies, the Department of Ethnic Studies, and the Critical Sports Studies Program. There are so many people who have been intimately involved in getting this event off the ground because we um, are so, um, so, so many of us believe in um, and want to support the work of Dr. Maeda in this really luminous, brilliant book. I will also say uh, we need to give a particular thank you to Marisha Lopez um, in the College of Arts and Science Diversity Office, who's been doing um, really heroic work in getting this event off the ground, as well as um, uh, as well as the staff in my office, the Center for Humanities and the Arts, who have been kind of handling a lot of logistical uh, events, including Diamond Darling, who's helping behind the scenes. So I'm going to give an introduction to Dr. Maeda and Dr. Tongaraj, and then uh, you won't see me until the Q&A. Again, please use the chat robustly to communicate um, amongst yourselves, but please use the question and answer section of the webinar to pose questions, and I hope you have many, many questions um, for Dr. Maeda and Dr. Tongaraj about, again, a brilliant, brilliant book that would make a lovely gift and the holiday season is coming up. So without further ado, um, let me begin with Dr. Tongaraj, who is going to be in conversation with Dr. Maeda. Stanley Tongaraj is the inaugural James E. Hayden Chair for the Study of Race, Ethnicity, and Social Justice, as well as the Director of the Center for the Study of Race, Ethnicity, and Social Justice at Stonehill College. His interests are at the intersections of race, gender, sexuality, and citizenship, he studies immigrant and refugee communities in the U.S. South to understand how they manage the black-white racial logic through gender and the kinds of horizontal processes of race making. Um, and people should definitely check out, we're going to put a link to Dr. Tongaraj's full bio. Brilliant, brilliant scholar. Please check out his work. Um, and then, of course, we have um, my friend, uh, Daryl Joji Maeda, who is the Dean and Vice Provost of Undergraduate Education at the University of Colorado Bar Boulder. Um, he's an ardent advocate for students, oversees the undergraduate experience with particular focus on student success, equity, and inclusion. Uh, Dr. Maeda is a leader on issues of justice and equity, having co-chaired the committee that created the IDEA plan, Inclusion, Diversity, and Excellence in Academics, which is CU Boulder's Strategic Diversity Plan. So without further ado, Dr. Maeda and Dr. Tongaraj. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. That was a very um, a great introduction and generous. Thank you, especially to all of the people who have put in hard work in, in, in creating this event, in publicizing it, in managing the list logistics to all the centers that you mentioned um, and to the Department of Ethnic Studies, which I'm very proud to be a member of. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Ho, um, for having me here. And I just want to take this very quick moment to say I am forever indebted to Dr. Maeda and to Dr. Ho for their leadership in supporting so many of us. And this book 
is a testament to these types of connections and scholarship that affirm us. And I am thrilled beyond words to share this space with Dr. Ho and Dr. Maeda. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, so um, Stanley and I have known each other for years and years. And so it's really just a pleasure to be here with you, um, Dr. Tangaraj, Stan. Um, I, was, I would love to just uh, start out by saying, you know, one of the things that I think is, it has, has been so rewarding to me in writing this book has been that I thought that it was going to be an easy book to write, and it turned out to be a very hard book to write. Um, back in 2011, I had just uh, finished writing my second book um, on Asian American activism in the 60s and 70s. And I was thinking, I was about ready to go on sabbatical, and I thought, well, you know, I just need to find another project. Maybe there's something that I can do real nice and quick. Maybe there's a book that I can knock out in a year or so. Uh, I started thinking about Bruce Lee for various reasons and um, asked people around me, do you think this would be a good pro book project? Would people be interested in this? And everybody said, yes, this, this could be a great project. I thought, great. I'm gonna knock this out. This was in 2011. I figured a year, year and a half at the most. And the book came out in 2022. There's <laughs> many reasons for that. One's like the slowness of my writing. Another's, uh, you know, the fact that I, I took on some additional responsibilities, but the real reason for it was that at every turn, every uh, piece of Bruce Lee's story that I started to track down became more and more interesting and more and more significant. What I found is that his life was not simple, but instead is an encapsulation of much of what we have seen happen in the world in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. And so that's that's kind of where I'm coming out with this book, and I'd love to explore that with you um, as we go forth today. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Daryl. And, and what, what we have here is one of the most stunning contributions to thinking about cultural history and to thinking about movement and migration through Pacific routes that completely destabilize how we understand routes as a linear process. So today, as we begin, um, uh, to pay as much homage as I can and to respect the work, which this is such a beautiful contribution to many fields, I'm going to start with a poem I wrote about the book and this was a very difficult poem to write, but so much fun to write because like the book, it shows us all these global connections and weaving in and out of so many political movements, so many political identities and within realms of pleasure and desire as well. And so here is, here's my poem to start the conversation on like water. Water. Pacific currents, flows everywhere, sneaking in, inhabiting, replenishing, Pacific currents, quenching, destroying, altering, Pacific currents, reshaping. Hollywood, the camera, the gaze, the rock against the water, needing Chineseness as a monolith, a rock against the waters of life and cultural production. Hollywood, never swimming in the waves and currents of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Hollywood, scooping out the water with pails of white supremacy and white desire and the white gaze, where the expansiveness of Chineseness could only take place in Hong Kong. Hollywood's oriental, differently decoded and differently desired outside the West. Appa, Appa, five foot nine, 100 pounds, my father, a smoking Indian intellectual, I beg of him, can we please see the Bruce Lee movie? Please, metal bars lined up like a fence from ground to asbestos ceiling for 50 yards. Thummel men, lots of working class men, lower caste men jostling, climbing on top of each other to get tickets. Fists of fury, enter the dragon, delight, hope, a desirable masculinity to challenge all forms of oppression. Bruce Lee spoke Thummel. Bruce Lee had Thummel politics. I wanted to get so badly in that line. I was too small and too young. Look what Bruce Lee can do, small and young. I hope my dad would jump in line. 
He jumped only into sermons and gospel songs. We young men desired Bruce Lee, the muscles, the expansive lateral, the tight pectoral muscles, the speeding, the jumping ability, the power, the philosophy, the charisma. Siphon, Mo Si Tong, Seo Long, Bruce Lee, Pacific histories, Pacific flows, Pacific histories, flowing in many directions, filling spots not always visible, often silenced and erased. The Pacific is not a thing. The Pacific is not a nation. It is a refusal. It is a disidentification. It is a polyvalent materiality and symbolic in a symbolic universe. And formless, shapeless, like water. So you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes a bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. The water can flow or it can crash. The water, my friend. The Pacific, San Francisco, Hong Kong, Seattle, San Francisco, Hawaii, Hong Kong, LA, the Pacific, everywhere, the Pacific, Blue, Bruce Lee's body, Bruce Lee's movement, Bruce Lee's fighting style, an archive in geography of the Pacific. The Pacific is a move exceeding history, exceeding nation, exceeding region. It is a geographic practice that is unmoored and ungeographic, a methodology and theory, reconceptualizing time and space. Quote, Pacific history bridges the different yet overlapping histories of Asia, Oceania, Europe, and the Americas to help us understand the Pacific as a far-flung and diverse entity that is nevertheless worth considering as a whole, end quote. Big Boss, Fists of Fury, Way of the Dragon, Water of Movement, Water of Fighting Styles, Near Waters, bringing Chinese diasporas across Asia and Europe, enter the dragon, third world, world solidarity, third world movements, civil rights movement, Black Panthers, US imperialism, Hong Kong, never a monolith of experience or narration. Quote, it is clear that three trans-Pacific strands, commercial and racial crossings, Cantonese opera and Chinese cinema intertwined to create the conditions that led to Bruce Lee's birth in San Francisco, end quote. Water, like water, offers a way of conceptualizing Asian, Asian American, Bruce Lee, cultural, imperial, and colonial histories, where it is never a solid matter. It is not fully materialized and cemented, crossing borders and borderlands, occupying, managing, and incorporating, quote, be formless, shapeless, like water, end quote. Fighting against style, quote, this water, the softest substance in the world only seemed weak in reality. It could penetrate the hardest substance in the world. That was it. I wanted to be like the nature of water, end quote. Jeet Kune Do, borders porous, flowing in and out of something already not containable, cross-pollinated, a refusal of one dimensionality, quote, stylish crystallization, end quote. Jeet Kune Do, Judo and Jiu Jitsu, Japanese internment, Japanese empire, Filipino, Inosanto, Tabak, Toyak, or Nunchaku, Taekwondo, Jun Ri comes, memories of the Korean War, karate, kung fu, Chinese resistance, Chinese gatekeeping, boxing, Muhammad Ali, anti blackness, anti Chineseness, managed, negotiated, and challenged. Everybody was
Jeet Kune Do, water. Movements, water. Representations, none. Yet the scrolls, reels, and screens across Hollywood limit, contain, and define the Chinese, the Asian. Capitalism, colonialism, imperialism, flowing like water, flowing with water, with air, experienced on the ground in a multitude of ways through cinematic promises deeply desired. Quote, his incessant uh, shuttling across the great ocean enabled him to synthesize martial arts in ways never seen before, to combine Asian and Western philosophies, to remake Hong Kong and Hollywood action films, and to break racial boundaries in both his personal and professional career. His impact on the world was as brilliant as a flash of lightning, but it lasted much longer, end quote. Like water, like water a meditation, a philosophy, a theoretical intervention, a bodily practice, a migration that holds space, but refuses to be contained. So that in many way for me, Daryl, captured the depth and the incredible contributions of your work. And so I want to ask some questions to you now. So with the ways in which water is so central to your project, can you tell us <coughs> how water works as an archive? Because in this chapter, you, in your book, you re-narrate the histories of martial arts, the histories of people we know. Chuck Norris's history in the military and his Trans-Pacific Currents, right? And so I was wondering, how does water become a methodology for engaging with the archive for you in this book? Well, first of all, Stan, thank you. That was incredible. And I feel like we could spend the rest of our time together just unpacking your poem. And uh, I really, really enjoyed that. And uh, in the chat, lots of people were responding to, uh, everybody was Kung Fu fighting 1974, um, which is interesting, right? To think about the fact that by the time that single hit the charts in the United States, uh, Bruce Lee was dead already. Uh, but, you know, you, you are so right that water is the central metaphor for this book. Um, currents, flows, um, eddies. Um, water, as Bruce Lee said in his most uh, famous quotes that, uh, that you noted, is, is a multivalent force. It, it has the ability to be both uh, pliant, right? He says, you pour water into a cup, it becomes the cup. But at the same time, it has the ability to be incredibly powerful. It can grind cliffs into sand. So, you know, in the same way that um, water doesn't take one shape and it doesn't take one strategy of making its way through the world, nor does it make uh, take only one strategy for altering the world around it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Bruce Lee as an individual, we can think about the multiple ways that he worked, that he uh, really ran into obstacles and oftentimes rather than going directly through them, flowed around them or at other times just ground them down into submission. But, you know, one of the pieces here that I want to, one of the things that I want to emphasize is that this book is not a biography of Bruce Lee. A biography is a book that will tell you about a person. A cultural history is an account that will tell you about the how. How did this person come to exist? Why? What were the factors that led to his or her or their, um, their emergence into someone that we think is worth studying and remembering? And a cultural history also tells us about the world around a human being. So, um, so I do want to talk about that. By the way, let me just also plug, if you're interested in a biography of Bruce Lee, the best biography is by Matthew Pauly, Bruce Lee, A Life. It's a fantastic book and I recommend it. This is just a little bit different, right? This is just, I, I have different aims with this book. And one of the aims is to really trace the, um, the extent to which Bruce Lee is a Pacific figure and a global figure. And that's not just to say, you know, like 
oh, you know, he became famous worldwide. That's not really what I'm primarily interested in. Of course, he does make it into the world stage in a way that had never happened for a superstar from Asia ever in history. And it's worth asking how and why. But I'm even more interested in like, how did he become the person, the actor, the martial artist, uh, the husband and father, the philosopher that he became. And that's where we really need to look at transnational migrations of people, of cultures, of ideas, of aesthetics, and ultimately even ways of moving the human body. And to do that, we have to look at, at, that, at multiple forms of uh, power that circulate in the world that impel these flows of people across national boundaries, across oceans. Um, and not all, these are not always things that we necessarily celebrate. That's, I think, another point that we need to think about here. So when we think about some of the forces that brought Bruce Lee into existence being things like um, transoceanic um, mercantile capitalism or, um, or you know, um, Trans-Pacific militarism, um, imperialism and conquest, colonialism, these are not necessarily things that we celebrate, but what we do do is recognize how these forces bring people uh, together across difference and enable them to make new forms of culture, new forms of knowledge, new forms of ways of being in the world. And so, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, take this in whatever direction that you want to take. But, you know, we can talk about certainly uh, his multi-racial uh, uh, background, personally, um, his, his philosophies, um, his, his personal life, and of course, you know, the evolution of his martial arts. I think lots of people are interested in that. Yeah, so, um, uh, I, you know, because this book, Daryl, is such a contribution on so many levels of the theoretical, and with regards to method, I was wondering if, if you could share like how you sought out the archive, right? And how does this seeking out of the archive and the silences that have come along with Bruce Lee that have refused certain cultural histories allow you like water to occupy these new spaces or occupy spaces that have refused him in the, or have refused Chineseness, have refused Cantonese opera, right? All of these things are, so profound, I would love to hear your take on, you know, like what are these archives you sought out, where, and how did you make this trans-Pacific and particularly global story and, and cultural history uh, still be coherent? It's, it's, it's a stunning book. Well, you're, you're far too kind. Um, I, I did really think that at the beginning of this journey, that I would need access to the archives of the Bruce Lee Foundation because they hold his personal papers. And I did write to them um, and they didn't, um, they didn't actually didn't respond. So I thought, well, I mean, I wonder if there's a way to write this book um, without their, their, you know, their private records. And here's what I found. Bruce Lee was a famous person. He was so famous that everybody who ever crossed his path Either, either wrote their memoirs and published them or uh, spoke about their encounters in interviews or uh, wrote them down or transmitted them in some way or another. Um, so I would say that basically the outlines of Bruce Lee's life are well documented and well understood. And so the challenge for me as a scholar and as a writer was to narrate his story and in such a way as to provide an interpretation of what he meant, right? Not so much, what did he do? What did he not do? But why did he do what he did? Why was he able to do the things that he did? And why did those things matter? Um, and ultimately, right, I think that what I found is that at every turn in Bruce Lee's life, um, you cannot understand the why and the significance without looking at the situation in the world around him. And in that way, I, be, I do betray myself as a historian because I believe that um, historical circumstances matter 
enormously. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that starts to get your your question, but um, you know, I, I, I oh well, let, let me add a, a couple of other things there. One is like sort of the archive of the written record or the oral record or what. Another and the another archive, of course, is his cinema, a cinematographic record, his movies um, and his television. But one of the archives that I think is less well um, explored is his kinetic archive. In other mm -hmm. words, the way that he moves his body, the way that people move, right? All, human beings move their bodies, but the styles that they use to move them, the purposes that they put movement towards are going to be uh, culturally bound and culturally relevant, right? So that was another um, archive that I thought was really important to, to explore, which is to say, right, how he advocated that people move their bodies through space and for what purposes. Yeah, and, and, and it was just amazing for me to go back to my own personal history of as a little kid in India, couldn't wait to get in there to be able to see those movements. But then reading your book, it forces us to go through these kinetic archives, right? So I've been infatuated the last week with looking at all these videos of Bruce Lee doing doing the drum, you know, the demonstrations of like the one inch punch and the six inch punch. And um, so with, with that, uh, I was really drawn to the ways in which your cultural history is also a rethinking of cultural production where it's always seen as this linear movement from A to B that leads to these various forms of cinema, martial arts, Chinese American history, but you're asking us to do something very different with, with like water. So I was wondering if you could um, share, share with us how, how you conceptualize water to think of cultural production as not contained in territory, territory, realized within the nation, right? Like this is something that asks us to rethink the nation's organizing logic as the way to think through cultural uh, production. Yeah, you know, uh, such a, this is such a great question, Stan. One of the things that I do in the book is I pair Hong Kong and San Francisco, you know, vastly different nations, but brought into being by some of the very same forces. They're linked by Trans-Pacific Capital. Both of them are uh, colonized territories that are wrested from their original owners. Um, both of them grow tremendously because of um, the growth of capitalism, uh, specifically Trans-Pacific Capitalism and the trade between Asia and the United States. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I think not a lot of people know about maybe or if, if, you, if you know your Chinese history, of course you know this, but one of the things that I think people who don't know Chinese history uh, well, is that's really interesting is that, um, you know, China becomes a territorial uh, property of, or yeah, Hong Kong becomes a territorial property, a colonial property of Great Britain because of Great Britain's desire, insistence in fact, on trafficking Indian opium in China, right? So you think about like the, that flow alone, right? Of connecting the, the South Asian uh, British empire to the East Asian British empire, and then connecting it again as, uh, as uh, Great Britain and the Western powers first colonized uh, um, Hong Kong, and then over time, right? Uh, opened up China by force to trade uh, that's really, I think, one of the most interesting things. And so when you think about how, how Hong Kong became this global port, this entrepot to China, when you think about how San Francisco became this global port, this entryway to the American West, um, there are both, they, neither of those would have happened in isolation. They, they happened simultaneously because they're both part of this process. And so that really in, that really shows us that we can't think about uh, the histories of these places as simply national histories. 
They're in fact transnational histories. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, I absolutely, absolutely love love that. And one of the things that your cultural history does is, you know, it also asks asks us to engage with the various realms of pleasure and desire, right? And the ways in which we don't use those categories to think about Asia and Asian America, right? There's been a certain shift. And I was wondering if you could share with us, Daryl, like what are the realms of pleasure and desire for you and your connection to Bruce Lee that is also, you know, playing playing out in this cultural history as well? Yeah, <laughs> I think there's uh, there's definitely an element of that for me. And that is, you know, like I think that as with most human beings who are able to see Bruce Lee as a bodily presence, right? That is, his body is a thing of beauty that I think all of us can enjoy gazing upon, contemplating on, um, and and <laughs> frankly wishing that, you know, we, we had that kind of a physique as well. I mean, uh, you were mentioning earlier today that you had worked out this morning. so. Uh, I'm not sure what's hiding beneath the, the the dress shirt, and maybe you do have Bruce Lee's physique. I personally do not. Um, but you know, just thinking about the body as a tool of liberation is is there's so much promise in there. Growing up as uh, as an Asian American young young boy in uh, in California in the 1970s. You know, when you think about like, who are some of the visible role models that were available to, to us, um, to me, right? Asian American men were first of all, not generally in the public eye, not generally celebrities and any representations of Asian Americans um, were, were by and large stereotypical. And for Asian American men, that means um, emasculated, um, and or and or played for laughs, and I think about like um, who was on television in the seventies. I think about like reruns of this is for the old folks out there. <laughs> reruns of Bonanza with Hop Singh, right? The subservient cook uh, who's who's frankly played for laughs. Bruce Lee is a wow. What a what a refreshing change from that, right? Not only is he uh, handsome, beautiful, uh, sexually alluring, um, but he's also portrayed as uh, powerful and as a hero. So that desire, right, to have that uh, that representation of Asian, of Asian American uh, strength, of honor, um, and also of beauty is something that, you know, like I, I wanted to celebrate. There's no question about that. No question. <laughs> And, and and so as we move through the chapters and we see like, you know, the emergence of Chinese film in San Francisco and then moving, moving out, you know, to then see how Bruce Lee, you know, then plays out much later in his life in Hong Kong to then finally come back to Hollywood. Um, those three films in particular, uh, Fists of Fury, Way of the Dragon, and Enter the Dragon. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe address like how does that as a cultural history show us a much more of a critique in Asian communities and Asian American communities about not only nationalism, but also ethno-nationalism, the way in which, you know, he is challenging you know, in fits of fury, what's what's happening in other parts of Asia and within, you know, the Chinese community as well. And so so I would love to get your thoughts on how does this book on cultural history also give us ways to think about larger histories of critique that have op that have operated, that have been critical of ethno-nationalist politics and not just the not nationalist and the imperial and the and you know the colonial. Yeah, so um, one of the things that I think is so fascinating about every, well, about everything that I encountered in writing this book is that when you start to trace out origins, what you see is that everything that seems simple is complex. Everything that seems like it has a linear source has multiple sources. And so even tracing out the history of Chinese cinema, 
takes you on this incredible journey of understanding how Chinese cinema is uh, produced in a transnational setting. Uh, it's true from the birth of Chinese cinema at the beginning of, at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, when you have uh, Chinese immigrants to Hollywood bringing back the techniques uh, of, of photography and even of makeup, film makeup. Uh, and, and then you have uh, Japanese cinematographers coming to Hong Kong to ply their trade there and and are influential on the style of filming that uh, that that becomes prevalent in in Hong Kong. There are um, multiple audiences on both sides of the Pacific, both in Asia and in in the Americas uh, for Chinese cinema. Right, so the Chinese diaspora is actually tied together by in in terms of audience because people are seeing the same movies in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in San Francisco, in Mexico City. Um, but, you know, when we get to, uh, when we get to 1960s Hong Kong, you know, Bruce has been in the United States. He's had limited success, but he's really hit up against that bamboo ceiling where, you know, Hollywood doesn't want to cast him as anything other than the sidekick. Mm -hmm. And so he, you know, he's, he's been in the Green Hornet and, um, you know, he's been since the cancellation of the Green Hornet, he's not found uh, success in Hollywood. He's been pitching ideas. He's had minor roles. Um, and is, uh, as it turns out, his, his show, The Green Hornet, in which he plays the sidekick Kato, has been playing in Hong Kong in reruns. So when he goes back to Hong Kong, he finds himself an instant celebrity because it has been a hit show in Hong Kong. It's running not as the Green Hornet, but as the Cato show. Um, and when he gets off the plane, he's besieged by paparazzi, by adoring crowds. And you know, all of a sudden he's like the prodigal son who's come back to Hong Kong, who's become, you know, he's made it big in Hollywood. Um, and that's what propels him into being able to sign a movie contract with Golden Harvest Studios and he makes um, he makes three films for them. These are the first films that he shoots in um, in Hong Kong as an adult because he had been a you know he had been a child movie star. He had been in probably 20 movies before he left Hong Kong for the United States at the age of 18. Um, and the, the, the contents of these films are incredibly resonant with, with Hong Kong audiences. It, each and every one of these films breaks the box office records um, that previously existed and of the box office record that the previous film had set. And they explore just amazing themes. Uh, this is also one of the things that I took away from doing this project is that these are not throwaway films. We can't just dismiss them as ephemera or unimportant, uh, but they are genre films that have a lot to say. So in the first uh, film, The Big Boss, he's really talking about diaspora and contemplating what it means for Chinese to be spread out around the world. In Fist of Fury, you know, which is just a, an amazing film, um, it's an explicit critique of Japanese colonialism. But one of the fascinating things that I find in this film is even though it's primarily, it's, it's super text, right? The text that's visible is a, is a critique of Japanese colonialism, but the subtext is really complex and fun to think about. So this is the film in which he first uses the nunchaku. And folks who don't know uh, Kung Fu might think, well, that's just, you know, that's just a Kung Fu weapon. It's not. It has complex origins, either in the Philippines or in Okinawa, right? And so how did Bruce Lee come to be familiar with the nunchaku? Well, it was because of his time in the United States, where he was training with Okinawan karate artists. That's one story. The other story, though, is that he was taught about the uh, the weapon uh, in its Filipino form of the tabak toyat, 
by Dan Inosanto, who was a Filipino American uh, martial artist and a uh, US military veteran, right? So when you see Bruce Lee unleash the nunchaku in this beautifully choreographed scene, it's just balletic. It's important to understand that this is not something that just happens if he had been a martial artist who had spent all of his life and trained for all of his career in Hong Kong, right? That right there is the trace of his Trans-Pacific journeys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Daryl. And um, we have several, several questions. So uh, Dr. Ho is going to um, come in and uh, help lead the questions because um, I am I am on my phone. I can't access it as, as easily. So Dr. Ho, please. Happy, happy to assist. Um, so uh, the first uh, question is, in the context of the civil rights movement, do you see Bruce Lee's embodiments of martial arts as a counter argument to nonviolence? Um, I would say that uh, Bruce Lee made the point in countless ways in his martial arts, in his philosophy, in his personal life, in his travels, uh, he made the same point over and over again, which is that in whatever struggle you happen to be in, you do what's necessary. And that it's not the case that what is right for one person is right for all people, right? He was a, one of the things that's really cool about Bruce Lee to realize in retrospect is that um, he was thoroughly an individualist. He believed that every person needs to find their own personal truths and that the martial arts are a, are a way to explore those truths. So, you know, if you're, you're asking for me for an interpretation and I'm, so I'll give you an interpretation. Um, I don't think Bruce Lee would have said that uh, nonviolence is the only way, but I also don't think that he would have said it is a false way. Um, you know, uh, it's it's very clear in um, in his work with uh, with African American people like um, Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul Jabbar, right? That he was familiar with black struggles. Um, you know, he even talks about it in some of his interviews. Um, that you know he he wants for Asian Americans the same thing that he sees African Americans pursuing which is full humanity. Um, I think there's some really beautiful expressions of solidarity, not so much with the civil rights movement, but with the black power movement in Enter the Dragon. And I think that's that's something we can certainly talk about. But, you know, I, I, I don't think that, um, that we would be correct to say that Bruce Lee advocated nonviolence or advocated you know, arm struggle, but like water, he would say, sometimes you got to use one, sometimes you got to use the other. Um, so I, I'd love uh, Dr. Tongarash to also uh, weigh in on this question. I, I think one of the things that strikes me at least about the how, how Lee is portrayed in the film and the characters that he portrays in his film is that he's not the aggressor, that he's somebody who responds with violence to aggression, either against himself or an oppressed people. Um, Dr. Tongaraj, do you have also any thoughts yeah. about, about this question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ho. And I think one of the things I see here is that it's also a stern commitment to see injustice in the most expansive way, to see it in all places that is not embodied in only one particular ethnic history, right? To And, and that's where the larger forces of imperialism, colonialism, and, and you know, cap capitalism play out in this incredible book. And that's where the way in which Daryl traces that history, where we see that moment where they're in Hong Kong and all of a sudden Bruce Lee is missing. He's helping a blind person cross the street, right? Like, <laughs> wow, right? And so there is something where to this, he was really committed to a vision of justice. And that methodology had to be fluid like water. And Excellent. it was, again, going, going back to what Dr. Ho said, like he was not 
someone who wanted to be acted upon, but rather wanted to act, right? It was not the portrayal of Asian Americans in film as always the site of violence, always the site of misrepresentation and the site of lack of flexibility, right? And here there's something so much more. Yeah, Fantastic. absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, he is, as, as you said, uh, Dr. Ho, always in search of justice for his community, for his friends, for his family, um, but he never takes first steps towards that, right? He's always in defense of the people that he loves. So that's part of being a movie hero though, right? That's just, that, that's the way movie her heroism works. Um, I think that one of the reasons why um, he, his, his image is so resonant in um, communities of color in the United States, you know, like African-American communities absolutely embrace Bruce Lee. And um, as, as Dr. Tankaraj said, in uh, press communities around the world is that he is that hope that change can come from one individual who has no tools at his disposal other than his hands and his feet and his brain. Awesome, awesome. All right, we have we have more questions. So this one's specifically uh, for you, Dr. Maeda. Did you have in mind readers from popular culture as well as from academic studies when you imagined this book project? In other words, who's who's your reader? Who should pick uh -huh. up your book? Such a great question, thank you. Um, that was really a hard thing for me to, to work out over the course of the book. And that's really why I'm gonna blame that problem for uh, one of the reasons that the book took so long to finish is I just didn't know who I was writing for. Um, and you know, like when I would talk to people, I would talk to my Uber driver or the uh, my barber or the bartender. What I found is that lots of non-academic people were really interested in this topic. And so I, I first thought maybe I'm writing for them. And then, you know, that was really hard for me because I know how to write an academic book. Right? Like I've done it um, and it comes naturally to me. Um, so I, I went back and forth on voice and sort of level of detail. And what I, when I finally broke through, I had this conceptual breakthrough, which was, I'm gonna write to my, my students, my undergraduate students. Um, undergraduate students are very smart people who are not that well deeply steeped in the academic world. And so our job as teachers is to bring them from, you know, being, you know, very, again, very intelligent people, interested people to understand a greater point. And so I ended up writing this for, you know, what I would think of as, you know, undergraduate population. In other words, people who are interested in the topic, uh, but are willing to go with me on an intellectual journey. And so that's really what I tried to do. And I hope that that came through. I, let me also just say, I think what you're also saying is that your book would be really wonderful for course adoption for those of us who are part of this talk or listening to the recording who are thinking about planning our classes. So um, let me move on to the next question, but I just wanted to put in that plug. Um, so this is from one of our CU Boulder colleagues, Dr. Yanomoto. Thank you, Daryl, for this terrific book and talk. Could you speak to how the hyper-masculinization of Bruce Lee might have affected and might continue to affect images and understandings of Asian women as submissive, subservient, and weak? And, and Dr. Tangraj, I, we'd love your thoughts on this question as well. It's an excellent question. Yeah, okay, so that's a uh, such a great question. Um, I think that I can honestly say that there's not a subtext in any of Bruce's films about, um, you know, sort of uh, women's liberation or empowerment. So I think that you're, you're, you're right about that. And I, at the same time, I don't think that it's necessarily um, a zero sum game in that the, um, that the, the empowerment of Asian American men would have to come at the, at the, uh, to the disempowerment of Asian, Asian American women. Um, I think one of the things that I've, you know, like really come to understand about Bruce is that he had a, a fairly limited understanding of many things, right? He had extremely advanced understandings of many things as well. But, um, but, but gender and gender equality, probably not 
at the forefront of, of his thinking. Um, it's, it is interesting though, that there's, there's all sorts of traces of elevating the traits of femininity to, to be powerful in the Bruce Lee story. One of them is that he studies this, the form of uh, Kung Fu uh, called Wing Chun. And Wing Chun is known as a soft form of Kung Fu. It eschews kind of the hard blocks and rigid kicks of other forms of Kung Fu or art forms like uh, Karate, right? Um, and instead it was the, there's always a creation legend behind martial arts and they're exactly that, they're creation legends. Uh, but the origin story of uh, Wing Chun is that it was created by Wen, who uh, was trained in the Shaolin Temple, but that it's an art form designed for smaller people who may not possess as much strength to be able to defend themselves against bigger, stronger, larger opponents. And so, you know, this really is where um, sort of one of the early um, ideas of, of, of the Tao comes in for Bruce Lee, right? He, did, he says um, the, the, the quality that I want to embody is that when my opponent expands, I contract. When my opponent contracts, I expand, right? So this, this sort of du duality and this mutuality of uh, struggle in the martial arts, not always having to do what we would consider to be uh, the male traits of domination and hegemony. Um, you know, another is that, um, you know, he was, he was known by a, a a, a family nickname, a, a female family nickname when he was young and, you know, for, for various reasons. But, you know, as when we think about like this idea of, of sort of yin and yang, of duality that's not really duality, that's really unity, um, I think that might be an interesting way for us to think about um, how to take Bruce and his life and his, and his philosophy forward to think about things like gender, right? Gender not being a binary, uh, gender being something that we can uh, think of in fluid ways. But of course, all of that is to say, that's applying Bruce in a way that he certainly didn't apply himself um, at, at the time at, at which he was alive. Thank you, Dr. Tonkin. Yes, <clears throat> yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for that great, great question. And I think one of, you know, and that's where I think the methodology of water allows us to see where can this flow next, right? And that's the project. I think um, one of the things that is really not necessary for the next book on this is to think about how is this, how does Bruce Lee encode a certain type of masculinity and how is it differently decoded, right? To bring in Stuart All, like how are audiences engaging and re reinterpreting and creating new types of desire that aren't bound and legitimated and really embodied in a hyper-masculine figure, right? Like how are different readings of Bruce Lee that work outside the language of hyper-masculinity, hyper right? And so, so I think, you know, um, that this is where, I, you know, I think uh, Mimi Wynn's book is really great. The 2006 book on a Asian American popular culture where she engages with, you know, queer Asian American readings of Bruce Lee, right? And so there are ways in which I think is absolutely vital for us to think about queer readings and to work outside of, you know, the binary logic that often has been really uh, very deeply embedded in how we understand Asian and Asian American cultural production, right? And so this is, I think, a really important way to think about how can we decolonize, you know, uh, the reading of film and the audiences that can allow us to see a much larger audience, right? Not, although I was in line in India with young men, there were women as well, right? And there, it was segregated lines that there was a line for women that men also were pushing women out, but women were there. Right. And so how can we think about this also through the realms of female masculinity? What types of trans man masculinity is prevalent through 
bodies that run like water, right? And I think there's a lot of potential as that next gap to be filled in with future scholarship. Thank you so much, Dr. Tangaraj. Um, we've got time for one more question. So apologies to people who we don't get your question. And I'm going to kind of fold two of them in together. Um, and this is a question about popular culture. And so if we think about the cinematic legacy of Bruce Lee, in what ways can we think about um, the filmography and his legacy in terms of the things that came after him? Um, from a global Asia perspective, we could say, or from a particularly U.S. cinematic perspective. So we're thinking about Kung Fu, like that terrible TV series, right, that he, mm -hmm. um, with, that was made for him, but then that got produced with David Carradine, you know, all the way up to Crazy Rich Asians, um, as well as the ways in which, if we think about the many, many different films that have come out um, featuring martial artists who maybe aren't Asian or Asian American, right? So how how can we think about Lee's legacy? Is there cultural appropriation of Asian mar martial arts happening in popular culture that is then deeply imbricated by white supremacy, anti-Asian racism? I know this is a big last topic and, and we technically only have until 10. So if both of you are willing to stay a little bit later to have this conversation and if people need to leave, that's great. But if you want to stay for the answer, um, that would also be wonderful. <laughs> that's a huge question. Thanks, thanks for posing it in an organized way. Um, so, you know, the, the question of cultural appropriation is really, really a uh, complicated one. And so I don't really want to address that per se, but what I do want to say is that um, we live in a mongrel world, which is to say that everything we believe has pure origins and came from one place actually has multiple origins. Um, and, you know, recognizing that I think is a really important um, intellectual, cultural, and political uh, move. So, you know, when you think about um, Hollywood productions in 21st century America, you think about, you know, uh, Mission Impossible or The Born Identity or, you know, any number of action series, what you see is the imprint of Bruce Lee and of Hong Kong cinema. There's no question about that. You think about like, um, how, did, how did they used to fight in the Westerns, right? It was some lunk would walk into the saloon and uh, say whatever he had to say and then straddle over and throw a big giant round a uh, roundhouse punch that would take 15 seconds to land on some guy's head, right? Um, and then they would scuffle a little bit and that would be the end of that. It was not beautiful fighting. It was not effective fighting. It was not direct fighting. So, you know, when Bruce Lee comes onto the scene first in uh, the Green Hornet, you know, he actually is showing me the United States Asian martial arts for the first time. And, you know, in all of the cinematography that he does, um, he, he displays like really, truly effective ways of fighting. Uh, and, and in Wing Chun, right, the principle is directness. You don't go the long way around if you can get there directly. Um, and, you know, it, Bruce's own philosophy in Jeet Kune Do is you do what you got to do, right? If you need to get someone in, on the ground and gouge their eyes out, that's what you got to do because it's this is about survival. So, you know, we can think about like how U.S., um, uh, action film and choreography is thoroughly, thoroughly um, like just like created by an absorbing of some of these principles. Um, is that cultural appropriation or not? I'm, I'm actually not interested in that. But what I am interested in is people understanding the extent to which we cannot understand anything as purely white American or black American or Asian American. In this culture that we're in, we are all constantly, constantly influencing each other, right? Like why do we see, you know, uh, Wu-Tang Clan, for example, right? And why do we see the, the, the intense imbrication of martial arts and hip hop? It's because we have things to teach each other and to learn from each other. Thank you. Dr. Tonkaraj, any thoughts about Lee's film, filmic legacy and cultural appropriation of martial arts in general? Um, 
you know, that is where I think uh, I can, uh, uh, Dr. Maeda's points, you know, I will, I will not add any more. I cannot possibly add any more. <laughs> you know, um, what I can say is, you know, what are the moments in which Bruce Lee pops up and becomes a object of study and a point of historicity, right? And so I wanna ask us all in that, I think what Daryl is asking us to do is to refuse the idea that cultural production has to be highly visible at all time and has to reach a particular global scale. And that's where, you know, for me as a scholar of sport, I say, why aren't, why, are we not talking about Jeremy Lin? Why does Jeremy Lin become relevant only in that time period? Just, just like, is Bruce Lee relevant only in a time period? Or can we, like this book asks us to move like water and get into all these other spaces that shows us Asian American cultural production on a global scale? That is already a transnational project that is always in conversation with other communities of color. And so that is where, you know, I would love for us to think about how does Daryl's book then give us a signpost of how to find these gaps and silences and erasures and let the water flow. That is, that's a brilliant way to end. Let the water flow. Let us all be like water. So um, big round of virtual applause for um, you, Dr. Tangaraj, for being here, being in conversation. Uh, for you, Dr. Maeda, to show us just how brilliant your book is. Um, we are, um, thanks to Marisha Lopez, going to be able to have all the hyperlinks saved. We will put them on a website with the recording of this conversation, which has really just been so rich and wonderful. So, um, you know, and just lovely to be in dialogue and conversation with both of you and to see so many friendly faces um, who have showed up for the Zoom event. So, Thanks, everybody, um, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much, Jennifer. This was wonderful. I really appreciate the opportunity. And Stan, it's always great to chop it up with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Daryl. And, uh, and thank you, Dr. Maeda and Dr. Dr. Ho, and for Marcia and all these other folks that played a major role in organizing this. Thank you for giving me this great honor. One of the greatest honors I've had. Daryl, thank you for your book. Oh, it's a, such a pleasure and such an honor to be here with you.